Hi, welcome to the Catholic Corner. I'm Monsignor Walter Nolan. Many of us have heard of the Knights of Columbus. I'm not sure how many of us had heard of the Knights of St. Peter Claver. My guests today are going to tell us about St. Peter Claver, a great, great saint, and his significance to the black Catholics, as well as tell us about the anniversary of the Knights of Peter Claver that they're going to be celebrating real soon. With me today is Father Rayford Emmons. Father Rayford is an assistant pastor at St. Cyril of Alexandria Church in East Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, and he's a very active young priest. He's a community and parish outreach worker for the Catholic Social Services in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Father Ray, welcome to the Catholic Corner. Thank you, my senior. Also with us is Sandra Layton. Sandra is the president of the Philadelphia Central Committee of the Knights of Peter Claver and the Ladies Auxiliary. Sandra, welcome to the Thank Catholic you. Corner. And also with us is Pete Isley. Pete's a permanent deacon at the Immaculate Conception Church, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he's also the author of the soon to be published, I believe, The Deacon's Story. Yes. Pete, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Marvelous to have you all. Okay, thanks That's a lot. terrific. Nice to be here. Maybe, maybe you could just tell us a little, Father Ray, uh, a little bit about yourself and maybe your, your calling to the priesthood and how God has led you here. Well, uh, uh, I was born in a uh, Protestant family. Uh, both my mom and my dad are from Florida. Uh, I learned out later, as I grew older, after I became a Catholic, that my uh, mother had been raised in a Catholic home and had uh, been baptized Catholic. Uh, but her family, early on, uh, became Methodist. Uh, so I was like bringing the family back to its Catholic roots. Uh, I became a Catholic when I was around 15 years old. I had always felt a call to be a minister or a missionary, so I kind of transferred that uh, once I became a Catholic into thinking about the priesthood. So I entered St. Charles Seminary sometime in the 60s, got finished um, in the 70s, and ever since I've worked at various parishes where I've worked in youth ministry, prison ministry, uh, social service like I'm doing today, uh, many multicultural parishes. I've learned many things about different languages and how to say Mass in them, and um, I found being a priest uh, pretty exciting. Sounds like you had a great, uh, great vocation, and you still got years to go. Thank you. Hope That's so. great. That's <laughs> great. Ray. Pete, you're a permanent deacon. Tell yes. us a little bit about that, and also I want to ask you just a little bit about this great book you're writing. Uh, well, this, it wasn't my call to be a permanent deacon. At, not my call. Uh, it was the Blessed Mother's call through another permanent deacon. I, I, as you well know, I, I work with the Vincentian Fathers, you know, and I've been working with them for about 12, 13 years. And, uh, I, and this deacon would always come to me and I'd say, you know, you perform your duties so well and you speak so well, you should be a permanent deacon. And I said, well, no, I don't, my life is fine. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't need that. <laughs> so, but uh, Mary had something else in mind. So uh, he continued to bother me every week he, that he would come and he was the permanent deacon then at the shrine where I work. And uh, he would uh, still continue to bother me and harass me about, you should be a deacon. I said, no. He said, well, I'm going to bring you the ap application. He brought me the application. I laughed at the application. I said, well, I'm going to fill it out and send it in just so I can get him off my back. And I did, and I laughed when I put it in the mailbox. And about a month later, I get a letter in the mailbox, permanent diaconate office, and I open it up, you are accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't even have a high school education at that time. Is that right? Did it, and I couldn't believe it. And so in September, I began to, uh, to study at St. Charles Seminary, where mm -hmm. I spent eight years of my life out there as well. I was ordained in 2001 by Anthony Cardinal Bevilacqua, I spent four more, year, four more years in religious studies to become a certified religion teacher by the Vatican. Well, that's a great, nice. great, both of you have great stories. Uh, yeah, the deacon story is primarily aimed to target young people and people, uh, who, and people who have left their children, mothers and fathers. You know, and, and the deacon story is basically about um, uh, young people who are being seduced by alcohol, drugs, sex, the occult, and broken families. This is what the deacon story is all about. 
And uh, see, growing up, my life was anything but ordinary. And I had been introduced to a lot of these things. And uh, so the Blessed Mother is the one who really inspired me to write this book because she had been after me to write this book for almost, uh, I'd say, a good three years. And I told her I could never do it. I could never do it. And so what happened is unbelievable. I was on the treadmill, and I broke. I, no, I pulled a tendon in my right leg, and I sprained the left, left leg ankle at the same time. And so I went to the orthopedic. He puts a cast up to my knee on this leg, and then he puts a brace up to here on this leg. So I'm laying around now. I can't work. So I'm home, and all of a sudden I get this thought again, this powerful thought. I know it's there. Oh, you can write it now. You ain't got nothing to do. You can't work. And I said, no, I can't never do it. I was scared to death. But then one day she came and all this warmth just came over me. I said, okay, I'll try it. So I started dictating and started writing. And I said, oh, yeah, I can do this. And that's how it all began. It took me a year and three months to finish it completely. And soon it'll be finished, and soon we'll be able to read it. Three to four it. weeks. Terrific. It'll be finished, and you can get it at www.exlibris.com. You're not going to send me a copy? <laughs> of course I'm going to send you a copy. And now we will. <laughs> yeah, we'll send you a copy. That's what you so Tell me a little bit about yourself, and, and I'd like to hear about St. Peter Claver. Okay. I was born a Catholic mm. under my dear grandmother, in Bowie, Maryland. In Maryland, huh? I was raised, but I was born in Philadelphia. And um, I came to Philadelphia when I was in the fourth grade because she took sick. And um, my mother was working in Philly, so she had to come and bring me to Philly. And um, I have belonged to many churches due to moving around the city. But the first church that I remember attending was St. Charles Boromir Church. Then I went to St. Thomas Aquinas. And I went to um, a church in Germantown. I can't think of its name right now, but uh, St. Francis of Assisi. And from there, I came to Most Blessed Sacrament, and I've been there almost 35 years. Oh, that's marvelous. Years. And St. Peter Claver is one of your dear friends. Yes. Back in 1991, I was approached by a lady who was sort of going around the church recruiting people to join. And I thought to myself, oh, I think I will. It's a Christian organization. Had, having good values. Um, so I accepted. And in July, I think it was the 19th of July, 1991, we were established, uh, our court. The men had been ex uh, established in April of the same year. And we were initiated into St. Peter Claver organization. Now, why is St. Peter Claver so special to the black community? I, I'm going to answer that. Um, there's um, thousands and thousands of saints in the Catholic Church, um, but there are probably a few in the last couple hundred years who are outstanding in their uh, stance for social justice. Uh, St. Peter Claver is outstanding in the fact that uh, during the slave trade in Latin America, uh, he openly and overtly opposed it. Uh, he was in um, uh, Cartagena in Colombia, and he opposed it so strongly that he, as he brought together many lay people as well as clergy and religious uh, to welcome the slave ships as they came in, and he washed the people clean as they came in, the Africans. He would baptize many of them who were dying. He started ministries and apostolates and orphanages and schools uh, for these people as they came. He um, uh, fought strongly against any abuse of the people, and he tried to introduce and increase the, the manumission or, or freedom for the people. Uh, 
the most impressive. He did this for 40 years, and he, during this period of time, he uh, actually baptized 300,000 people. So it's an outstanding uh, record of uh, social justice excellence. Uh, because he was outstanding for that, he became the patron in the Catholic Church of social justice, of African Americans, of um, uh, movements for freedom. And so somewhere in the mid or late 1800s when he was made, he was canonized a saint, um, the African Americans adopted him as one of their patron saints. And when the organization started, he was the most likely candidate to name him after. Well, that's great. That's a great, great, great man. And, and this, the community of St. Peter Claver, the, the, the Knights of St. Peter Claver, mm -hmm. how, how did that start? Or I know you, you were talking about yourself, but how did, is that uh, a society that's been in existence a, a long time, or where did that start? Since 1909. 1909. Um, three Jesuit priests. Uh, uh, Josephite. Josephite, I'm sorry. Um, established yeah. the Knights of St. Peter Claver. Yeah, it, the Josephites uh, had been working with Catherine Drexel, who was from Philadelphia and this area. And she had been, uh, since the seven, 1890s, she took the apostolate of working with Native Americans and black Americans. And um, somewhere in the 1890s, uh, black Catholics had gathered together and had five what they called the Black Catholic Congresses, in which people came from all over the country to deal with issues involving black Catholics. Was religion. this all in Philadelphia, Father Ray? Uh, well, one of them was in Philadelphia, but one was in tour in Washington, D.C., one was in Baltimore, and one was in Detroit or Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, when, as we were developing all these, one of the ideas that came out was to establish a fraternal organization that would be for black Catholics. Later, this I had developed into the Knights and Ladies of Peter Claver, and the whole idea was to uh, provide something parallel to the Knights of Columbus to provide a place where people can come together, practice their faith, and then be outstanding examples to other people in the community of what it meant to be a, uh, a black Catholic. Uh, and then to have a ceremonial group, which is popular at those times, knights and there's some like the other groups that are not Catholic, the Masons and other forms of knighthood. Uh, they would wear the ceremonial garb and that kind of thing. The women would wear white to represent ladies and to encourage people to have um, uh, supportive of their parishes and the diocese and their priests and to kind of encourage people to uh, be good Catholics. Well, that sounds, that's just a marvelous, marvelous example of, uh, I always call it the, the, the miraculous love of God coming into our communities, into our world, and, and how it develops. Uh, uh, Pete, how did you get involved in the, uh, in, in the Knights of St. Peter Claver? Well, basically, um, my involvement have been with uh, uh, with the uh, Knights of St. Peter Claver is, uh, basically I have spoke at a lot of their big events and celebrations that they have because I have a history of being a very, very good preacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so when usually sometimes when they're having like big celebrations, they would call me uh, and, you know, I would, you know, accept the invitation and I would come and speak at their celebrations. And, you know, I've done that uh, several, quite a few times now. And I really, really enjoy it. They're a great group of people. They're a great group of people to work with. And they're so loving, and they show that love of St. Peter Claver. They really do. And um, I'm just happy when they call me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to draft me, but I'm in so many <laughs> other different ministries. Oh, that <laughs> join them, Pete. Join them. Join them. Grown hurt. Now, is that, uh, that organization that has spread out throughout the country and, 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 uh, and abroad, has it, just like the Knights of Columbus, it's a, it's a worldwide organization now? Yes. Uh, we're in uh, 24 states. And we recently went to Colombia. Uh, I think it was Colombia. Colombia. Yeah. Which, is, which is interesting which, because that's where um, St. Peter Claver right? ministered. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So it's interesting to go back there. Uh, it, it's, uh, in, uh, when they celebrated its 50th anniversary around 1959, there were about 12,000 members. That has gone way up since that time. It's probably closer to 50,000. Uh, it used to be in 25 states or so, and it stayed, but now it's about 34 states. And Philadelphia is one of the larger ones in the country. Um, there are different districts in which the nation's divide, divided into, and um, one of the larger ones in our district is Chicago, but right after Chicago is Philadelphia with 500 members. 
and 10 different courts and councils. And what are some of their activities? And uh, you said social justice, so I'm assuming that that's the very basic, you know, uh, context of what they do and, and what the folks do. But how, tell me something of what we support our pastors. That's in, always a good in thing. The church. Sorry, we support <laughs> those pastors. <laughs> and we also um, support charitable causes mm -hmm. like the um, NAACP. We support them. We Urban League. Urban League. Uh, Xavier uh, University. Uh huh. Xavier University. Mm -hmm. Um, we also support this, uh, a national program, which is the Sickle Cell Program, Soaring High, Human which Development. Is, Soaring High is a collegiate program that tries to get scholarships for young people uh, and tutoring programs so that mm -hmm. young people can qualify for college and uh, to encourage their, their, their college attendance and doing well in school. Well, that, that why you, uh, we started in... Mobile, Alabama, is that correct? Yes. yes. And uh, w was there a, a black community already there? Uh, and did it spring up like grassroots or, or somehow did it come from Philadelphia and go back and go down to, uh, to Alabama? I think the history was that, um, that there's a lot of black Catholics in the South, okay? Mm -hmm. And especially black Catholics who lived in and around uh, Louisiana, which is very Catholic, uh, Texas, uh, Alabama. Eastern Texas um, mm -hmm. and Alabama and Mississippi, believe it or not. And because of strong black Catholic influence, especially because of the French and French Catholics, French Catholicism down there, uh, it was one of the best places to start. New Orleans was a major, major, major. In fact, way, way back, I remember uh, about 20, 30 years ago, they were doing statistics of black Catholics around the country. There was something like 200,000 black Catholics in that, that geographical area. So when they started, plus Catherine Drexel had many places there, as well as the, uh, the Society of Divine Word and Joseph White Priest. So it was a great place to start, and you had a lot of people there, and um, it, it, it started there, and then now its headquarters is in New Orleans. In New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the, uh, Philadelphia, though. Who started it there, and how did that start? Well, Jan, um, it looks like uh, you're going to tell me the whole story here. Yeah, uh, back in uh, 1986, uh, we had our first council and court established in Philadelphia. And it was stationed at Most Precious Blood Parish. And um, this year we're celebrating 30 years um, anniversary of the f establishment. And we, um, we have maybe about, f I would say maybe um, a half a dozen men and women from that original council and court. And in November, on the 3rd of November this year, we're gonna be having a banquet in their honor. And uh, we will be inviting them to the banquet. And hopefully we will have a good guest speaker um, for that. And- Is that someone we know, Sandra? When we sent out, we don't, we don't know who it is. We don't, we don't know, know yet. right we, we now. Sent, but we <laughs> sent twelve invitations out to people who sound famous, and uh, we hope one of them says yes. <laughs> we hope. Yes. Um, so from that first council in court, we now have nine other nine council different councils. Mm -hmm. Well, it's ten all together, including including that one. one. But uh, are, that's there, are they all like uh, based in local parishes? Is that how it works? Yes. yes. Just like Knights of Columbus, in a sense. Of, yes, exactly. Of a, same, uh -huh. same general. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, we t we turn out at various um, parishes when the pastor requests us to do so. We we turn out at the cathedral when the Cardinal wishes us to turn out. Mm. And um, the, the, the mass most important is St. Martin de Port's mass. In November, we turn out uh, men, the ladies, the juniors, and it's a big mass. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, we, we do have junior knights and junior ladies too. Junior daughters. junior daughters. So young people between 17, what, 18? Uh -huh. Seven and 18. 18. Seven, years, seven years old and 18 years old can participate. 
And it's basically trying to get young people interested in some of the same things the knights and ladies do. Yeah, yes. And actually kind of get tied in in an official way with your church and parish so that you develop leadership skills. And hopefully one day come into the council and court. As, as sure. a full knight sure. or a full lady. Mm -hmm. And to do the great work of social justice and, and sometimes just a friendship that, that bonds right. them together and gives them support and gives them hope. Uh, well, well, one of the things we're doing is also the spiritual side too because along with being a knight, uh, you have people when you die or you get sick will visit you, will pray for you. Um, we have liturgies throughout the year since I'm chaplain to recognize individuals and pray for them, uh, deceased members and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do things like um, uh, we have retreats. Uh, the thing is to make you as close to Jesus Christ as possible because he is the knight of all and then to internalize that in how you practice that in your parish and your community. Now, does every uh, organization have a chaplain or someone who somehow this has mass with them or, or well, gathers normally them together? Normally, the, the pastor okay. is the chaplain of that individual oh, counselor good. court. Good. However, in the ladies' um, court, we have a lady of prayer ah. who works with the pastor. Now, would, that, we, would that be Sandra? Would you be a lady of prayer? <laughs> No, uh, Monsignor. I know you pray, I have, but I, that's I the title been, it sounds like. It sounds like, a, <laughs> don't say been, no. <laughs> I have been the grand lady okay. for about eight years. That's terrific, huh? And uh, now I'm the financial secretary of my court, uh -huh. but I was elected the president of the Central terrific. Committee. You know, I love history, and I know some of our viewers love history. Can you tell me a little bit about... Um, Catholicism in your community, the black Catholics how, in Philadelphia or, or Pennsylvania, how did that, where did that come from? Was it from down south brought up? Or tell me a little bit about that history. Uh, the interesting part is that um, a lot of times people think of black ca Catholics and the black people in the Catholic Church, they think of it as a, probably a very recent history, maybe the last 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And um, what happens is if you have a, a view of world history, blacks have been in the Catholic Church since the very inception of the church mainly because it started in the conjunction of Africa, Asia, yeah, and, and, and Europe. St. Augustine. So, St. Augustine. Uh, so you had African saints all up and down northern uh, Africa and Egypt and Ethiopia, all kinds of places. Okay. And you had always had mixed race populations too, where people are a mixture of all. So, so black Catholics have been there from the very beginning. Um, when you come to the United States, um, some interesting things. There was a historical thing where someone said, uh, did a book called They Came Before Columbus, noting that there have been black Christians who had left Africa in the third century and had come to the uh, Central America. And they believed that among things that they taught the Native Americans there was how to build pyramids. So many of the pyramids come from people who were from Phoenicia and West Africa. Uh, then we go on with uh, the earliest black Catholics in modern times comes with uh, Pedro Ninine, uh, who comes with Columbus. And then we have people come with the Spanish and most recently in the United States, in the English colonies, we have black Catholics who've been there, came in Maryland versus uh, bondage, and then later as freedmen. And then uh, somewhere around the um, Haitian Revolution uh, with Toussaint Louverture in the 1790s, many more people come to the United States, increases the population, and as the Catholic Church spreads, as the United States spreads into the French colonies, um, they find a Catholic, black Catholics are there. Today, um, when I was first became a Catholic, there were probably about 800,000 ca black Catholics in the United States today. There's about four million. Well, that's terrific. Uh -huh. And that four million, are, they're not all part of St. Peter Claver, though. No, but I, I do not. understand you're having a big anniversary celebration. Yes. I'd love to hear about that and tell our folks about that anniversary celebration and activities or bus trips or what's going on. Well, as recent as this past Saturday, we had a historical bus tour, and uh, Father Emmons was the narrator, and it was a very good tour. Those that didn't go missed it. He'll run another one then. Yes, okay, we, next we hope, year, I hope to. Uh, we're also looking at doing something where we're having fundraisers. Uh, we're also having a, uh, a celebration, a, a retreat, where we celebrate the Black Saints and Martyrs. Uh, we're also having a, um, uh, a recruitment day uh, with something called Unity Day that's done on Philadelphia Parkway, Benjamin Franklin, and we're going to be passing out literature about the nights and getting people interested in joining us. 
Uh, is, is it going to be a big celebration? I mean, you have a big mass, a big party, a, a, a feast, uh, rent out the hotel and have a banquet? November the 3rd. November 3rd. 2007, we will be having a banquet. Um, we Currently, Father Emmons is going around to each of the 10 parishes doing the uh, mass or can celebrate the mass, and we're using that as a recruitment effort. And we're also giving out certificates uh, to mm -hmm. uh, each of the courts and councils for their years of participation in the Knights and Ladies. Now, can anyone participate in this uh, celebration? As you don't have to be a member of, of St. Peter Claver. No, we Knights. are inviting other people, <laughs> religious, you know. Yeah, if you got 50 bucks and you want to buy a ticket, buy you're a ticket. Welcome. We'll be glad <laughs> that you free come. Book from <laughs> <Deacon Pete? laughs> you get the free book. We'll, give you, we'll pay for that, but the 50 bucks we need. <laughs> Did you guys get a grant from the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops uh, for uh, some of the justice uh, projects, the literary projects that you're doing? Mm. Is there some grant that you uh, got from the U.S. Conference of Bishops? Well, I, I do know that na na nationally there have been things been going on. They've, they've pushed sickle cell anemia research. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done things that have worked with... Um, <laughs> Uh, the Catholic, con what's it, the Campaign for Human Development. Mm -hmm. right. uh, that's been, those are national things. Uh, the, nationally, I think they also sponsor young people going for World Youth Day, which is done. Sometimes they sponsor kids going there. And um, other efforts that involve the Bishop's Conference that might have something to do with uh, helping people in need. So then we, we, we gather together in, in prayer and faith and love. What are some of the future hopes of the uh, Knights of St. Peter Claver? Well, we are, we are doing a recruitment mm -hmm. this year, hopefully uh, for the 100th anniversary, which will be in two years. 1909, uh, 2009. 2009. <coughs> uh, we will have increased our membership, both the Knights, Ladies, and the Juniors. Yeah, we're especially at the young people because you see what's going on in Philadelphia today with all the, uh, the, the murders and things like that. Mm -hmm. We know there's always a need for young people to become involved in something positive. Uh, and um, this really does offer a lot of positive things. We're trying to actually kind of polish ourselves up, our image, uh, on TV, radio, newspapers. We've done some newspaper articles. And well, I think you've done them. some great, great, great uh, credit to your, your faith and your love and your people, and it's marvelous. If you'd like to have some more information about the Knights of Peter Claver, please call 334-265-3214 or website www.kofpc.org. Knights of St. Peter Claver, a great saint, great people, a great love of God.